The cold, unforgiving waters of the Atlantic Ocean hold countless secrets, many of them tragic. One such tale is that of the Annie Jane, a shipwreck that has captured the imaginations of historians and storytellers for generations. From the moment the ship set sail, to the haunting aftermath of the disaster, the story of the Annie Jane is one that will leave you spellbound. An inscription on a nearly forgotten monument on the windswept shore of Vattersea Island off the coast of Scotland reads, on the 28th of September, 1853, the ship Annie Jane with emigrants from Liverpool to Quebec was totally wrecked in this bay and three-fourths of the crew and passengers, numbering about 350 men, women, and children were drowned and their bodies interred here, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it. The relentless power of hurricane-force winds and brutal waves stripped the Annie Jane of its rigging on that day, and the sea broke her to pieces on the rocks by the west beach of Vattersea Island. 350 bodies washed ashore or floated in the shallows on that dreadful day, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it. The tragic saga of the Annie Jane shipwreck ended with this prophetic verse on the monument to its victims. Her horrific voyage, however, also began with a prophetic omen. And if it had been heeded as such, the wreck may never have occurred, the passengers' lives may not have been lost, and this monument may not stand today. The second half of the 19th century saw record immigration to North America. People throughout the world chose to leave their homes and immigrate to the United States and Canada. Fleeing land and job shortages, crop failures, high taxes, and famine, countless numbers crossed the Atlantic Ocean by ship to North America, the land of opportunity. In 1853, four ships were built in the Cape Cove shipyard of Quebec. The largest, and the shipbuilder's jewel, was the 1,300-ton Annie Jane, a three-mast, triple-deck, Atlantic Ocean trading and emigrant vessel. It measured 179 feet in length, 31 feet wide, and had a depth of 23 feet. After a flawless maiden voyage from Quebec to Liverpool in the summer, the Annie Jane was set to return to Quebec, fully loaded with cargo and immigrants, in the August of 1853. Its crew was led by Captain Mason, a seasoned, brave, and sure seaman, with years of experience at the helms of vessels like the Annie Jane. The crew was comprised of 42 French, Canadian, and British sailors. Over 400 passengers embarked on the Annie Jane for her upcoming voyage. Most were Irish immigrants escaping the potato famine. A significant number were construction laborers headed to Canada to build railroads. First class included a group of eight from the French Canadian Missionary Society. Among the mission group was Pastor Mark Ami. He would later document the voyage in his 1856 manuscript. The vessel on which we would be making the voyage was magnificent, new, sturdy, triple-masted, and we were assured, an excellent sailing ship. She was called the Annie Jane. Finally, after nearly a week delay for routine maintenance, the Annie Jane left Liverpool and was towed by a tugboat through the Irish Sea in the North Channel, where it set sail in the North Atlantic Ocean, off the coast of Scotland. On August 26, 1853, we set sail for Quebec. The wind was favorable, the sky was clear, and everything breathed life and joy. To sailors of the time, setting sail on Friday was considered unlucky. That would ring true. On the morning of August 29th, the sky was red, and the peaceful beginning of the voyage would abruptly cease. The omen would arrive in a set of three. The once calm sea quickly erupted with winds and rough waves. The Annie Jane struggled as it lurched side to side in the swells, and the winds increased to gale force. Soon, a violent gust tore through the sails and snapped the three topmasts like matchsticks. The top sails and spars crashed down, destroying portions of the deck. Seawater rushed through the cabin, wreck further havoc on the passengers and their belongings below. The three broken masts were more than a setback, they were a sign. They were an omen to those on board to not attempt to cross the Atlantic in the Annie Jane, an omen of the 350 dead to come. By the end of the day, an eerie calmness returned to the sea. No one died, but the passengers were traumatized and afraid. Nonetheless, the debris was cleared, minor shoddy repairs were made, by the next day, Captain Mason again set course for Quebec. The passengers, however, had lost their nerve from the three broken masts, and hysteria broke out among them over the captain's decision to continue the transatlantic voyage with reduced and damaged sails. The passengers were certain that a watery grave awaited them if the ship continued towards Quebec. 
the travelers begged the captain to return to Liverpool. Finally, after several pleas, Captain Mason relented and turned back toward the coast. The Annie Jane docked in Liverpool, where repairs to the ship would be undertaken, and the 450 passengers and crew disembarked. Nearly a hundred of the passengers swore to not set sail on the Annie Jane ever again. Those would be the lucky ones. They saw the three-sail disaster at sea as the omen it was. Had the remaining passengers made the same decision, the tragic loss of human life to come may have been avoided. On Friday, September 9, 1853, the Annie Jane was repaired. The unlucky travelers, filled with trepidation, reboarded, and the ship set sail for Quebec again. The sea was calm, and a nice breeze from the southeast favored our progress. We went ahead with full sails. The trip was off to a placid start, and that peace would not last long. On September 12th, the gentle breeze rapidly shifted to a stronger and stronger headwind. The once calm sea was replete with heavy swells and white caps. The Annie Jane rocked violently at the mercy of the gale strength winds that had returned once again at nearly precisely the same location as the accident of the first voyage. The Annie Jane had found herself in the midst of a furious storm, in the midst of the omen. The premonition from the first voyage began to manifest itself as reality. A fierce gust of wind came and split the foremast in two. The heavy mass crashed to the bow of the ship, damaging some of its timber. Seawater again began to pour into the ship. The remaining two masts and their sails sustained considerable damage, but remained standing for the time being. After more than two days of strong winds overpowering the ship, the sea finally calmed. The ship's carpenters repaired the masts and the bow as best as possible, but much of the significant damage was irreparable. Despite the incident, Captain Mason turned the ship westward toward Quebec once again on September 15th. Vehement opposition to the captain's decision to continue the journey quickly spread throughout the ship. The passengers were terrified that the ship would never survive the voyage to Quebec, and rightly so. Near mutiny ensued. A group of travelers rushed to the top deck and confronted Captain Mason over his decision to continue on, instead back to the port for repairs. Captain Mason pulled out his pistol in response to the questions by the hostile passengers. Fending the passengers off with his revolver, Captain Mason exclaimed, Quebec or the bottom? He swore to shoot anyone that attempted to stop him from continuing the ship on its current course. The passengers retreated from the captain's confrontation in an even more fearful state. After much contemplation over the next several days, Captain Mason eventually changed his mind. The captain informed the passengers that they would indeed be heading back to the nearest point in Londonderry, Ireland, for repairs. Relief and hope quickly spread among all on board. Nearly a week after the damaging winds, the ship changed its course and headed towards Londonderry on September 18th. Unbeknownst to all on board, the Annie Jane was headed into the eye of the storm. Later, on the same day on which the Annie Jane had set sail for its new course back to port, the sky blackened, and the high winds and ocean swells returned with a vengeance. By nighttime, large waves were rhythmically sweeping across the main deck of the ship. The Annie Jane rolled violently back and forth. The ocean's punishment soon began to take its toll on the vessel. The main mast began to loosen from its fasteners and was increasingly becoming more unstable. Then, a spar from the foremast blew off along with its sails in the heavy winds. According to Captain Mason, the winds were blowing at hurricane force and the conditions were too dangerous to attempt any significant repairs. On September 20th, the main mast broke free and crashed overboard with its sails. The ship had essentially been rendered helpless. For three days, we were thus tossed around by the torrents, described Marco in his manuscript. On September 25th, another lull in the storm returned for the next several days. The sailor's crew had desperately attempted to make repairs to the Annie Jane, and attempted to get back on course towards Londonderry with a makeshift mast and sails. The rolling of the ship had fractured the seams between the vessel's planks, and water was constantly leaking out of the deck at a disturbing rate. Passengers and crew were ordered to work bilge pumps to attempt to prevent the ship from taking on more water. The ship labored southward at a speed of less than five knots through the wind and fog until September 28th, when a sailor spotted land for the first time in two weeks. The St. Kilda Islands were sighted about 15 miles from the ship. At 2 p.m. on the 28th, the captain notified the passengers that the Isle of Barra on the outer Hebrides of Scotland was within view. Toward seven o'clock at night, we made out the lighthouse and we saw with trepidation that we were headed for dangerous reefs. 
Markami reported. The light brought some hope, but it was tempered by thoughts of the treacherous reefs, rocks, and sandbars of which the bar ahead lighthouse was giving warning. Later that night, the winds once again rose to storm force out the west and began to blow the Annie Jane toward the reefs surrounding the island. The winds rose to a perfect hurricane, according to the passengers. By now, the Annie Jane had lost nearly all of its sails. She was helpless in the rough seas. Captain Mason was left with only one option to avoid certain death on the reefs. He turned the ship towards West Beach on the nearby Vattersay Island, the hope of running aground in a sheltered, safer location. Vattersay is a small island in the southern outer Hebrides, measuring approximately 3.5 miles long by 1.5 miles wide. It is largely composed of grassy moorland with very few inhabitants, a scattering of homes and outbuildings. At 1145 on September 28, the Annie Jane forcefully ran aground off West Beach Vattersay and was immediately met with a large wave. The massive shock threw all on board to the ground. It was high tide and the beach was still a far ways off. The breakers soon turned the ship sideways. Mark and me described what followed. At the same moment, an enormous swell opened the side of the boaty, and the waves entered with a fury. The passengers rushed to the ship's lifeboats. However, the violence of the breaking waves had swept the lifeboats from the deck and into the sea before they reached them. The last hope of salvation for the passengers was lost. Without warning, a wave larger than all the others slammed into the ship forcefully crossing the deck and instantly sweeping nearly all of the passengers into the ocean. For a brief moment, the screams of those being swept to their deaths rose above the wind and waves. Below deck, the sea was quickly filling the vessel. Cargo, countless bodies, and survivors clinging for life were violently tossed throughout the inside of the vessel. Soon, the ship separated into three parts. The middle section was torn to pieces and driven underwater by another massive wave, sending many more passengers to their graves. The forward and rear sections of the ship broke free. The front section, where many passengers remained, continued to fill with water and nearly sank. An untold number drowned in the next several minutes. The rear section began to float toward the beach. Survivors frantically scurried for the raised deck of the rear section and huddled together for warmth. The rear section came to rest close to shore at 4 a.m. Many passengers would die from hypothermia throughout the night. Low tide and calm seas arrived at dawn. Sixty survivors remained close to shore on the rear section, shivering and clinging to life. Others clung to the forward section of the ship. The beach was covered with the bodies of the dead, most of which had been crushed, disfigured, or maimed by the torrent of the wake. More corpses were still afloat in the sea, with cargo and passenger trunks. That day, the survivors made it to the main beach of Vattersay to help us some wary and somewhat unfriendly island inhabitants. Captain Mason counted the survivors. 102 of the 450 persons who set out in the Annie Jane survived. 36 crew and 66 passengers remained. For two weeks, the survivors remained on Vattersay under shabby, half-hearted care of the few residents of the island at the Vattersay house. The fateful journey of the Annie Jane, her omen, and the deaths were over. Today, the shipwreck of the Annie Jane off the coast of Scotland has faded from the memories of most. The omen which preluded the tragedy is nearly forgotten. Only this eroded monument commemorates the Annie Jane nightmare and marks the spot of the 350 dead. Some things are too frightening to remember. And the sea gave up the dead. Revelation 2013